So, tonight, we are going to be talking about a very important topic. And that topic is the pursuit of holiness. So, a little spoiler alert for my whole message. But, you know, the true pursuit of holiness is a lifetime endeavor. You know, wherever you are in that pursuit, uh, we must be told and reminded about where we are and uh, where we need to go and where God wants us to go. You know, God has a very high standard. It's a, it's a high and perfect standard. And from that standard, he can't do anything less but ex- expect the best from us. You know, we can look at this standard from two different ways. You know, we can look at it, we, we can look at that perfect standard and say, uh, I can never be perfect, so I'm not even going to try. You know, that's one way to look at it. Or, you know, we can look at that standard, that perfect standard that we could never achieve and say, you know, I may never get there, but I'm going to spend my whole life trying. You know, and that is the pursuit of holiness. That is is what we should strive for every single day. That every single day, we are striving closer and closer to the uh, pursuit of holiness. You know, Christians as a whole start taking, uh, Christians as a whole, we need to start taking our Christian walk more seriously. You know, we need to start fully and completely pursuing that standard that God wants us in our life. But before we can pursue that holiness, let's first define what holiness is. Let's see what what the Bible says about holiness. You know, before we read our, our setting of Scripture, we can define holiness as being separate, or set apart for God's purpose. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. We'll be jumping around a lot tonight, so keep your fingers handy. In Hebrews chapter number 12. In Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You know, through this verse and many others, we see that holiness is essential for our Christian life. Yet, if we would go to any church, ours including across America, you know, we see people, myself included, not living up to God's holy standard. You know, hopefully everyone here tonight, you know, you have at least the desire to be holy and more obedient to God's commands. So tonight, let's, let's dive into, let's dive into and begin looking at this pursuit of holiness. So, before we can look at this pursuit of holiness, we need to see where this holiness first comes from. First off, we see that God is holy. You know, before we can ever pursue holiness and go after holiness for ourselves, we need to see that holiness is first comes from God because God is holy. You know, holiness is the most used prefix before his, God's name than any other name in the Bible. So when we look through the Bible, we see that God's favorite attribute for himself is holiness. And we see that because God, first and foremost, he must be holy. And you know, many times in our life, we complain against God. And I'm sure many of you here 
you've complained against God. I know I have. You know, things aren't being fair. Things, uh, things that didn't go our way. You know, when we complain against God, we are in, in effect denying his holiness. You know, a quote by, by Stephen Sharnock, it says, It is less injury to him, referring to God, to deny his being than to deny the purity of it. The one makes him no God, the other a deformed, unloving, and detestable God. He that saith God is not holy speaks much worse than he that saith there is no God. So when we in our life complain against God, when we are um, denying his holiness, that is worse than saying there is no God because we are deforming that view, that perfect view of God. So before we get our view right of God, before we get this holiness right, you have to view sin in the correct way. First, you know, sin has to be viewed against God. You know, all of our sin, whether I sin against somebody, let's say that I slap Wyatt in the face, you know, ultimately, my sin is not against Wyatt. I may be mean to him, uh, but ultimately, all of our sin is against God. And when we view our sin that way, that's when we can first start to fully view God in his right place. You know, we never see sin all right until we see it is against God. All sin is against God. So, you know, when, when I make a mistake, when I... Um, and mean, whenever I'm mean to my wife, whenever uh, I do things I'm not supposed to, you know, ultimately, I need to realize that I'm doing this against God. You know, it, when, I, when I get upset, when I get angry, I may be uh, taking it out on somebody else, but ultimately, my sin is against God. And that's something that you know, we can say, oh, yes, I know that's true. But if we truly believe that and believed in our heart that our sin is against God, we would take a second to think about the things we're doing. You know, when, whenever, and I'm using myself a lot as an example because that's, that's the biggest sin I can think of is my own. But let's say I... Uh, you know, Julia asked me to take out the trash, and I say, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I won't forget. And then I, you know, I'm in the middle of something and doing it, and then a couple hours go by, and, and Julia goes by and say, Aaron, you haven't done it yet. I would sit, and then I'd say, oh, okay, yeah, so, sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll take care of that in a little bit. And then I continue to forget about it. You know, uh, in, that, in that situation, I, I broke my promise against Julia. But ultimately, you know, my sin is against God. You know, if, if I stopped and think, you know, oh, it's not, this, it's not that big of a deal. I'm just, I just broke a promise to Julia. That's not a big deal. Or if, if I stopped and said, you know, I lied. And maybe I, I lied to Julia and said I would take it out. But ultimately, I lied to God. All of our sin is against God. And if we truly sat and thought about it, you know, it would be a lot harder to sin if, if every single time we stopped and thought, you know, how would God see this? I'm doing this against God. And so when we get that view correct, you know, our life, and our view starts to become different. Our view becomes more separate and more holy when we have the correct view of God. And also, in, in reference to, to God's holiness, our holiness is dependent on God. If you want to look at Hebrews chapter 10, 
in verse 10. Hebrews 10, verse 10, it says, By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, truthfully, nobody here could ever be holy without God first being holy. You know, our holiness is dependent on God. You know, there's a, there's a verse, we won't turn to, for, to it for the sake of time, but the verse says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. That verse means, and it's talking about um, back in Bible times, all of the lepers would be outcast from the city, and there would be a, a public rag that lepers would come and cleanse their sores with. And, you know, a public rag to, to cleanse uh, pussing sores, do you think that would be very clean? No, it would not. And so God is comparing our righteousness, not our sin, but our righteousness to that rag, that filthy rag. And so all of our, all of our holiness, any of the holiness we could even achieve, would be nothing if not for God. So we first we look at that holiness from God. And second, you know, God expects holiness. God expects holiness. He first, he, God commands us to be holy. In 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, it says, But as he ha which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You know, our first calling in life is holiness. God calls us to holiness. And, you know, that first calling is, is obviously, it's, it's important. And we see that many people always wonder uh, how this can be done. How can we be holy? And, you know, we'll get into, into exactly talking about our holiness through Christ. But, you know, first, we, we look at God expects holiness from us. You know, even when we're in a situation where we feel that we have no other choice. You know, in 1 Samuel 13, we won't turn to there, but I'll, I'll set up the scenario. You know, Saul was waiting for the the priest to come, the priest Samuel, and he was to he was supposed to offer sacrifice. He was told, "I'll be." Samuel said to to Saul, "I'll be there in in seven days." And seven days passed, and and Saul or Samuel had not arrived yet. And so Saul was at a point where he said, "You know, my ar my whole army is separating. They're running away. We need this sacrifice before we can go into war." And so he felt like he had no other option. You know, God put him in a place where he had no other option but to sin. And you know, we get into those same situations as well. You know, there's situations where you feel that God put us in a situation where we had no choice but to sin. You know, it wasn't my fault. This situation, there is no other option. But do you think God ex ex um, accepts that excuse in our life? Do you think God w will take that kind of excuse? Did he take it from Saul? No, he did not. He, and he, he took it very seriously. He took the kingdom from him because of this. You know, even when it doesn't feel like we have a choice but to sin... God still requires us to be holy, to be uh, an example for us. You know, holiness is required for a few things. First, holiness is not required for sin, for salvation. You know, holiness is not required for salvation. You know, ultimately, at the moment of our salvation, God has sanctified us. God has set us apart for his him. His calling. 
But before you were saved, we were not required to be holy. God is the one that makes us holy. And number two, God, uh, holiness is required for fellowship with God. Um, Psalm 15, 1 and 2 says, The Lord, or Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh upright and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. So if we are to have fellowship with God, fellowship with, with other believers, God expects us to be holy. You know, the, the verse I read just a little bit ago from 1 Peter said, God is holy, which means that God cannot accept anything but holiness. So when we don't live up to that standard of holiness that God has, we cannot have fellowship with him. And also, the next one, you know, a requirement for holiness, or holiness is a requirement for avoiding discipline. You know, because we just said that God is holy, whenever we are not holy, God requires discipline. And it's not because he doesn't like us. I'm sure even myself as, as a child, whenever I did something wrong, my parents disciplined me, not because that they, they were angry at me or they were mad, which I'm sure they were, but they disciplined me because they loved me and they wanted, to do, they wanted me to do what was right. So to avoid discipline in our life, holiness is required. And, number, and the fourth one, holiness is a requirement for being an effective servant. 2 Timothy 2, 21 says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. You know, God wants us to be set apart for his work. God wants us to be prepared to do everything that he wants us to do. You know, I'm sure in my life and in your life, there are things God wants you to do. Right now, there are things God wants you to do. And you know, my lack of holiness is pre preventing God from do doing something. You know, my lack of holiness is preventing me from doing something that God wants me to do. So if you want to be an effective servant, holiness is required. And so for the third point tonight, let's look at holiness through Christ. Holiness through Christ. You know, ultimately, our holiness is through Jesus Christ. In Romans 6, verse 6 and 7, it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. You know, through Christ, he has made a way for us to be holy. Before Christ, there was no way for us to meet that standard. There was no way for us to live up to that perfect standard. But God has made a way for us. You know, God, uh, Jesus Christ has delivered us from sin's control. It's now our job to resist sin. God does not resist for you. He simply has given you the ability to resist. It is our responsibility to resist. So if we don't resist sin, it's not because of something God has done. God has done everything for you to be able to resist sin. It is because of our choice when we don't resist sin. You know, at the moment of salvation. At the moment Christ becomes real in your life, you know, we are made holy in the sense that God has sanctified us, God has set us apart for his work. And, you know, in God's eyes, we are holy. But also, at the same time, we have a, a, an ever-reaching example of holiness that we need to meet. So, 
That leads me to my fourth point tonight. And that is the battle for holiness. In Romans 7, 18 through 21, it says, For I know that in me, that is my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more that I do it. But sin that dwelleth in me, I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present within me. You know, I hope this is not news for anybody here tonight. But let me tell you, you will be fighting against sin and for holiness your whole entire life. You know, I'm sure if I asked uh, some of our senior saints tonight, there was no age they ever reached where they were saying, okay, I reached, I reached 75 years old, and now, you know, I'm at a point in my life, I don't have to worry about sin. Is that true? No. <laughs> I didn't think so. You know, there is no point in our life that we get to the spot where, like, you know, God and I are good, I don't have to worry about sin, uh, I'm as holy as I'm going to get. You know, there's no point in our life that we're going to reach that. Every second of our life is going to be a battle for holiness. You know, if, if there comes into a point where you're content, you stop fighting, the battle is still going on. It just means that you're losing. If you give up and stop fighting, that means you're losing the fight. You know, it was, it was said to me one time that uh, the Christian life is like a, a fast river. You know, there is no standing still. You're either going forward or you're going backwards. So if you stop and you're standing still, that river is taking you back. You're falling back. So in our life, there is only progressing forward for Christ or they're sliding back. You know, and that, as I said, that, that applies for senior saints, that applies for everybody here, and that applies for me. There's nobody that gets to a point where they can't, where they don't have to fight against sin. You know, as I said a moment ago, at the moment of our salvation, the Holy Spirit comes into our life. At our salvation, you know, He comes... He comes to make us holy in practice. Uh, but hopefully there should be at least a desire to be holy in the eyes of God. You know, for a Christian to live in sin is to go contrary to God's very purpose for our life. You know, and salvation, for our life and salvation, that Jesus Christ died for. You know, today... We looked at very a very, very brief look at the pursuit of holiness. And I, as I said in the beginning of my message, you know, the pursuit of holiness is a lifetime endeavor. You will be, you will be desiring for, to be more holy, hopefully, your whole life. You know, there's always something more that you can learn about God. You can learn about uh, your Bible. You know, we were having some family devotions the other day, and we were talking about, uh, maybe it wasn't, actually, sorry, it wasn't family devotions, it was Genesis Kids. We were, talk, we were talking about our Bible, we were talking about uh, how our Bible is a living word. You know, don't you think it's interesting how every single time that you open your Bible, you can find something new, something more that God has for you? And that's because... This, this Bible that we have is God's living word. You know, it is, it is alive. It's, it's wanting to speak with you. It has something for you. It has a message uh, for you and a higher standard to, for you to reach for holiness. You know, everybody here, God has a purpose for you. You know, Mila, God has a purpose for you. 
Uh, Brother Charlie, God has a purpose for you. Clayton, God has a purpose for you. Everybody here, God has a purpose for you. And you know, to see that purpose, we must first do the little things in our life. You know, if, if, if you're a child here today, God will not show you your, his grand purpose for your life if you're not listening to your parents, if you're not doing the small things that God, that you know God, you should be doing, that God told you. You know, if you're an adult today, you know, obviously you're, you're not in your parents' house, but God has some small things in your life. You know, <clears throat> you have, if you're working, you have a boss that God has placed as an authority in your life. You know, <clears throat> everybody here has, has a pastor that has an authority in their life. You know, those are small things that God has placed in your life to listen to. If you do not listen to those small things in your life, those small authorities, then what does God have to gain from giving you this grand purpose if you do not even fulfill the small purposes that he gives you in your life? You know, everybody here, I hope that you have a desire to be holy, to be set apart from God, or set apart for God. But that starts today. It starts right now, deciding that today will be the day that you have this desire to view him the right way, to continue to battle every single day. You know... As I said a moment ago, God has a purpose for you. And I know at, at this point in your life, you know, you may be older, you may be younger, you may be somewhere in the middle. But God wants you to find his purpose. You know, he's not trying to hide it from you. It's not a game of hide and seek where he's, he has this, this purpose for you hidden somewhere and it's your job to try to go seek it out. God wants to give you his purpose. God has it for you right in front of you, and you can't see it. And it's because you're not starting with those small things that you know God wants you to do. You know, there's, I'm sure, and right in your mind, there's something that God brings to your mind that you, he, that you know that he wants you to do. And it's simply by starting there that God will lead you one step at a time, one small thing at a time, that will lead you into God's grander purpose. So make today that day that you decide that I will always battle for that holiness. You'll fight the fight. You will decide that today is going to be the day that you strive for that always advancing goal, that always advancing standard. You know, I'll read one more verse and we'll be done tonight. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, it says, For God hath not called me unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. You know, make that your call.